Thank you. So uh, I want to thank the organizers for the privilege of uh, uh, talking to you. You've heard from uh, Dr. Cox, who's a clinician colposcopist, and you've heard from Dr. Schiffman, who's an epidemiologist. Now you get to hear from uh, me, who's a pathologist. And I think fundamentally we're talking about, I mean, I could say thank you, Mark, and sit down, because he basically gave my talk, which is the idea that the question you, as most of you as clinicians, should have is, what is your threshold for doing various things to patients? And do you do that consistently? So these are my disclosures, uh, uh, which have nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about. Um, so from a pathology standpoint, or a biology standpoint, we know that there are basically three different states in the cervix. There are patients who have basically normal services or services that have nothing to do with uh, cervical cancer risk. There are people who have these low-grade lesions, which you'll hear over and over are characteristic of transient infection, are the, and are the pathologies that are correlated with producing virions. And there are people who have high-grade lesions that put them at significant cervical cancer risk associated with different populations of HPV types, different patterns of oncogene expression, and persistent infection, which if it persists long enough, becomes synonymous with, in my mind, with having uh, at least the risk of not having a CIN3 or a true precancerous lesion. And based on these three types of biology, we have basically three only, th only three things we can do to patients. We can have some form of repeat screening. We can take them to colposcopy to try and define if we can histologically find a CIN3 or certain significant precancer. Or we can treat the patient if the risk is high enough. And there's some patients where clearly the risk is so high that the risk will trump the outcome of the biopsy in my opinion, and we could have a conversation about that. And so these risk levels, as Mark just showed you, are basically broken into, uh, by expert consensus, into three relative risk bands. So if the risk of having CIN3 is less than 5%, we follow those patients uh, variably. Somewhere between 5 and 50%, people take it to col get referred to colposcopy, and I would rhetorically ask you, and then we can talk about it afterwards, what's your threshold? When I talk to clinicians, some people will say, well, 10% risk, I'll take them to colposcopy. Other people need a 40% risk for taking them to colposcopy. Somewhere around 40 or 50% people really start to worry because prevalent CIN3 then has a measurable risk of invasive cancer, and so if you're not going to go after those CIN3s, you're going to start to miss cancers and that goes up. So it's always about this trade-off between the sensitivity of your ability to find the precancer in the population versus the over-referral of patients and doing too much to patients who really don't have cancer. And variable diagrams, I think Tom Wright, who's moderating here, you know, drew up these, uh, these types of uh, risk diagrams that have the various choices that we have in our algorithm stratified by risk of CIN3, and I would fully support the concept that we should do the same thing for the patients who have the same risk. So these are really the questions, and the context that I want to talk about now is for low-grade cytology, ASCIS, which is really not a real entity, an equivocal cytology, ELSIL, which is a real biologic entity, and then patients who have a, the equivalent of ELSIL on cytology, a CIN1 biopsy, what do you do with them? And how age, the cytology, the HPV status, and a little bit about genotyping, should it influences where you are in this risk model, and then how you should treat it. So in the Bethesda system, we have these various categories of diagnosis. And these, back when the Bethesda system was first described and then re-revised in 2001, this diagram from the atlas was meant to show the irregular lines in the Bethesda system meant to show how these were not a linear or a defined uh, pattern of stratification of risk, that there's uncertainty in every category cytologically. But that through studies such as the ALTS trial and the clinical diagnostics trials that have been done in the last uh, 10 to 15 years and published in many publications, we get very good estimates of risk. So the risk numbers I'm going to show you are a little different than what Mark Schiffman showed, in part because they're a different age population, and in part because they're, they're, uh, 
they're derived from uh, populations where the intensity of looking for lesions was somewhat different. So let's look at low-grade lesions, which is a real entity first. So as a pathologist, this is what we see in uh, selected high-power fields on the pap smear, the typical coilocytotic atypia that's uh, pathognomonic of HPV infection, and it can have variable appearance. Some have bigger vacuoles, some have bigger nuclei, but trained cytopathologists are very good at recognizing. We know this from careful study that we've done with Dr. Schiffman and others, that good cytopathologists recognize this lesion reliably. And this lesion, the cytology is on your right, the histology is on your left. It's very clear that these cells that we see on the slide are a representation of the sur surface of the epithelium, and that if you do in situ hybridization or other molecular studies, the the bright white dots are where the virus is replicating uh, to high copy number in those coilocytes. So that this lesion is a manifestation of productive uh, viral infection and that this lesion has a, uh, th this productive viral infection is quite dependent upon this pattern of differentiation that we see morphologically in the cervix. So, the problem is, is that whether you, whether you see this lesion cytologically or whether you see it histologically, there's uncertainty. You're only taking a sample, and the sample is variable depending upon the skill of the sampler, that is the colposcopist, and the, what they see, where they biopsy, the size of the biopsy, as well as the pathologist. But when you put it all together, from the ALTS trial, we, we defined in patients in an age-stratified manner that the two-year risk of having SYN2+, plus, not SYN3+, plus, you could probably half these numbers if you only wanted to talk about SYN3, were smack into that middle wristband with some decrement in age because the prevalence of HPV drops with age and the uh, frequency of finding CIN3 also drops with age. And similarly for the biopsy, so instead of looking at the pre risk of having SYN2+, we can say after colposcopy, the biopsy is only CIN1, what's the risk of uh, the patient having SYN2+, even if the biopsy is only CIN1? We, Tom Cox showed you so nicely that the overall sensitivity of colposcopy can be quite variable. If we say it's on average 50 to 70 percent variable, then you're only going to cut those risks in half. And this is part of the reason why. So this is one section from a colonization of the cervix. And you can see that, you know, the ectocervix is normal epithelium. The uh, little further up the canal, basically three millimeters up the canal, you have a, a low-grade lesion or a CIN1. But right next door, so if your biopsy is off by a couple of millimeters, there's a CIN3. And if you didn't get all the way up in the canal, in this particular case, you have AIS, right? So for every patient who has a biopsy of CIN1, the question you have to ask yourself is, well, I found the CIN1, but what is the risk that I missed the CIN3? And the answer is, if you only take one biopsy, you've only cut the risk about in half. So that we have all these, these uh, false premises, if you will, that, uh, that have been uh, evaluated more systematically in the last 10 years than at the time when many of us were taught colposcopy or when colposcopy was brought forward. You know, that biopsy is perfect is clearly not true because colposcopy misses prevalent CIN3 about 25 to 50 percent of the time in the studies that we and others have presented. And pathologists don't read all the biopsies the same way, so some pathologist CIN1 is another pathologist CIN2, and many pathologists CIN1 are really normal. So when the biopsy, the patient has an H-cell PEP, the biopsy comes back CIN1, more than half of the time, another pathologist might call that biopsy normal, i.e. you didn't really find any CIN, not, not just the CIN1. So with that, I can quickly dispense with ASCUS because ASCUS is an equivocal category and in the Bethesda system we have all these equivocal categories. I'm just gonna talk about the squamous lesions because they're more common. ASCUS in Bethesda terminology means that the morphology is really not diagnostic of something that you could definitively call SIL or dysplasia or CIN. They really aren't, I can't show you a biopsy of ASCUS because I've never made a biopsy diagnosis of ASCUS, right? There's normal, there's CIN, 
Ask, ask us is something in between. It's very non-reproducible, and it's often a function of uh, sampling. But these borderline categories that we set up, like in the Bethesda system, are important because pathologists are trying to be sensitive when they look at screening cytology. They're trying not to miss lesions, so they overcall the morphology in an attempt to be uh, safe for the patient. They're trading off sensitivity for specificity. And in the US, historically, that overcalling of cytology was so common, cytology like this, which basically may or may not be associated with an HPV infection. So what did we do? We had the ALTS trial, which took this very large population, 5%, 10%, in some laboratories, up to 20% of diagnoses are signed out equivocally as ASCUS. And we know that we can split that population into a, po into a population that's at much higher risk versus much lower risk by using high-risk HPV testing to triage those patients. I want to say a quick word about ASCH because it's really not covered very much in other uh, categories. This is a category in cytology where we're worried about, as a cytopathologist, a high-grade lesion, but there are not enough cells where the cells aren't big enough. Cells that look like this would be typical of an ASCH, and another pathologist might say, well, that's just immature metaplasia. Again, we're trading off sensitivity and specificity. You as the clinician and we as the pathologist would ask ourselves all these same, all the same problems apply, but you can see that an ASCH cytology alone is a much riskier situation, that people who have this equivocally abnormal cytology where we're, where we're saying we're worried about high grade, we're actually much better at predicting the prevalence of high grade. It's a riskier category than the L-cell cytology. It starts to approach in some population the same risk as an H-cell cytology. Just a quick final word about how you can stratify these diagnoses using genotyping. These are data that we published uh, with Tom Wright and others from the Athena trial where we could look at the relative risk of an ASCIS cytology. So in this population, which is a slightly different older population, the baseline risk on the left for CIN3 is about 3%, so is very similar to what Mark uh, presented you in the population. And you can stratify that population of abnormal cytology based on the HPV testing results. So a patient who has a, ne a negative high-risk HPV test has a basically the same risk as a patient with a, or less than a negative pap smear. But remarkably, a patient who has HPV 16 or 18, so the relative risk from HPV negative to HPV 16, 18 positive is a 30 to 50 fold increase in terms of risk for the patient to have CIN3. So you can take a patient who's ASCUS positive, do a high risk HPV type, and through genotyping for 16 and 18, really refine. Uh, the risk in your mind of that patient having prevalent CIN3 to help decide whether they need to go to colposcopy or not. So if you summarize these data, the risk of SIN3 varies in the population depending upon how you approach your patient, where they are in the screening process, whether they've been stratified by HPV testing and cytology or not. And genotyping for 16 in particular uh, exaggerates or stratifies those risks further because we know that most of the most of this risk for prevalent uh, CIN3 in cancer development is driven by uh, the riskiest or most virulent viruses such as HPV16. S and that these estimates of cross-sectional risk that are that are being reported now from some of these large diagnostic trials are magnified even more, and we'll start to hear some of the follow-up data uh, as these trials mature uh, with long-term follow-up. Because even with good disease ascertainment, there seems to be still some missing of disease that may develop over a two, three, five-year period. So I would reemphasize that we should definitely do the same thing for patients with the same risk. And the concept here is that for every combination of cytology, with or without HPV testing, with or without genotyping, and then layered on by age, we have, we and others have published, as uh, Phil has uh, elucidated in many of his papers, that we can uh, peg down the risk in terms of how we should uh, evaluate the patients in terms of their SIN2-3 risk, and then what to do with them should be increasingly consistent for the same level of risk.
And with that, I thank you for your attention.